That was good fun, wasn't it? Right, so are all my kids up here? I've got some that just don't want to come up here. And here's the rule. If you don't come up here and listen, you don't get a sweet. Yeah. So I will let you guys decide whether or not you want a sweet. All right. Luke, if you want a sweet, you've got to come up here and listen. All right. I got a question for you guys. Who, not all the way up there. Come on, Luke. Come on. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. All right. I got a question. Who has ever been corrected by their parents? Yeah, I, I'm absolutely, you didn't even need to raise your hand, Luke. We all knew that one. <laughs> yeah, you've been corrected by your parents? So some of you have never been corrected by your parents? Oh, well, I'll tell you what that means. That means that you were doing something and your mom or your dad or somebody told you, don't do that. That's what it means to be corrected. So now who's been corrected by their parents? Never, ever? I find that hard to believe. So, when you're corrected by your parents, why do they do that? Eli, why does your mom correct you? So you were crying, and she told you off. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I don't necessarily mean what bad thing were you doing. Why did they correct you in the first? Why did they even bother trying to correct you, make you do things that are different? Luke? Because you might have a plan to destroy your whole house, okay? Zeke, why do your parents correct you? So that you're safe. That's exactly right, because if you're doing something naughty and they make you stop it, so you don't keep doing it for the rest of your life. In other words, they do it because they love you. And they don't want you to keep doing things when you grow up that are very naughty. In fact, in fact, well, let me ask you this. Do you like being corrected? No. You do? Who gets up in the morning and thinks, boy, I hope I get in trouble today? Yeah. And really, really, that'd be great. If I could just get in trouble, maybe even before breakfast, that'd be lovely. That'd just set the day off on a good, good tone and everything. No, we don't like to be corrected, do we? You know why? Because sometimes it's embarrassing, isn't it? Especially if it has to happen in front of other people, right? But it's also embarrassing even if it's just you and whoever's correcting you. Because it makes you feel like maybe you're not, not as good as you thought you were. But you know why else we don't like it? Because it requires something that you're never ever going to learn to like. Change. It means that I've been doing something wrong. And if I don't change, I'll keep doing something wrong. So if I don't want to get corrected again, if I don't want to get in trouble again. Right, Pippa? right then I'm gonna have to change I'm gonna have to stop doing what it is that I was doing do you think God treats us like our moms and dads sometimes no. does God ever correct us do you think God does it because he hates you no. do you think he does it because you're just plain naughty and he's sick and tired of you he does it for the same reason that your mom and dad do because he loves you and he doesn't want you to grow up and keep doing those naughty things. All right, you guys did very well today. Here's what we're doing with the sweets, okay? I'm going to pass it around. Just take the first one you see. If you don't like the sweet that you took, you can come back after service and swap it for one you do, okay? So you're just going to take a sweet, any sweet, so we can get it done, and then you can swap them later if you don't like the one you, you picked. Go ahead, Robert, take one. Take one, take one, just take one, anyone, anyone. Take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, take it. There you go, good job. If you don't like the one you got, you can come back and swap it later. Keep going, keep going, keep going, take one. Just take one. Go on, Alfie. 
There you go. Boy, still, still go quick. Yeah, no, that's the jacks. All right, go sit with your parents. Get your books out. Pay attention because we're going to be talking about that this morning. All right, off you go. Go sit with your parents. And our scripture reading this morning is found in John chapter 15. And we're looking at verses... Well, we're actually looking at more than these verses, but this is where we're reading from. Verses 12 to 17. John 15, 12 to 17. And Matt has that for us this morning. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Amen. Thank you, Matthew. All right, so by way of introduction this morning, we're going to have a quiz. All right, so the way this is going to work is I will ask a question. Some of the questions will have multiple answers. And you only need to give one of the answers. If you, if I see, and you know, don't blurt it out, adults. All right. I know, I know how excited you get when sweets are on the line. <laughs> don't blurt it out. Just lift your hand, and whosever hand I see first will get the first opportunity. It's harder than Lizzie's quizzes. Now, nothing is as hard as Lizzie's quizzes. Where'd she go? Did she run away? Yeah. All right, here we go. Question number one has three answers, so you only need to give one, and then we'll give somebody else a, a chance to answer the other ones, okay? Who are the... No, no looking in your Bibles, by the way. Who are the three main groups or individuals in John 15? Okay, mom? Vine dresser. Here you go, ready? Yep, another one back there, May? The vine. See if I can throw that far. Whoa. And, and Mick. The branches. There we go. All right. Now, those are the three main groups. What are their roles in the illustration? So vine, vine dresser, and branches. Who do they represent? Very good. Excellent. Theo? Oh, all right. Zeke? The vine is Jesus. Excellent. We've got one left. So, and the branches. Who are the branches? Alfie? Well, no, the branches. Who do they represent? No, the branches. <laughs> Bella? They represent us. Very good. Excellent. All right. Question number two. There are two other groups or individuals mentioned in John 15 besides the vine, the vine dresser, and the branches. We haven't looked at them in detail, but they are there. Who knows the other two groups or individuals? Vera? He does love us. Very good. Excellent. But that's not really the answer I was looking for. Maria? The false vine? That wasn't what I had in mind. <laughs> Who else? Mom? Unbelievers. Unbelievers or the world. Yep. And there's one other. It's an individual. Mentioned right at the end. No. He's mentioned right at the end. Yes. That's right. The Holy Spirit. That's what he said. <laughs> That's what I heard anyway. <laughs> so
So those are the other two, two individuals or groups that are mentioned. Good job, Eli. All right. What are the three things that we are told to abide in? Give me one of them. No. Oh, well. uh, May. The word. Yep. What else? Me? Me? Jesus? Yep. Whoops, sorry. And? His love. Very good. By the way, if you don't like the sweets you were given, adults, that's too bad. <laughs> All right. What happens, question number four, what happens to branches that produce fruit? Maria? They get pruned. And who knows why? Excellent. So they can produce more fruit. Very. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. So David draws and colors all the way through, but he knows every single one of these answers, doesn't he? Yeah. All right. Ready? Question number five. What happens to branches that don't abide? <laughs> all right. I think we had stereo there. So I'm going to give you one. And Luke, good job, buddy. <laughs> all right. I have one more question. What is the fruit? Oh, yeah. Kathy. Sorry? Not the answer I'm looking for. Being like Jesus. All right. Good job, everybody. Excellent. Ugh. I shouldn't be doing that. My got a bit of a cold this morning. That's why my shirt is coming untucked. All right. <laughs> I wish that was why my shirt was coming untucked. It's because I've been in the sweet jar. All right. So today we are going to wrap up our time in John 15. It seems like we've been here a long time. This is actually only the fourth message. By the way, this is message sermon number 81 in the book of John. And just to give you some encouragement, we're a good two-thirds of the way through it. <laughs> but today we're going to try and wrap up our time in John 15 by summarizing and applying what we have learned so far. So we're going to go over it, tie it all up in a lovely little bow, and hopefully walk away from the hair with our feet and our toes totally trampled on. Because I think if we really get serious about this, this is actually one of the most important things that Jesus says to his children about the relationship that disciples have with him or that Christians have with the Father. So I want to answer three questions. How to know you are a friend of Jesus? How to know you are producing fruit? And how to know you are being pruned? So the first one, how to know you are a friend of Jesus? Verse 14 says quite clearly, you are my friends if you do what I command you. If we do what Jesus commands us, we are his friends. That, it's that simple. Now, now, here's what's interesting. A little bit later, Jesus is going to talk about the difference between a servant and a friend. And a lot of times, in our Western way of thinking, we might think... If I do what he tells me to do, that actually makes me his servant. Don't we? Because that's what servants do. They do what they're told. And so we think of ourselves as servants if we're doing what we're told. But actually, Jesus says, you're my friend if you do what I tell you to do. And I'll tell you why. I keep coming back to this. Because when we do what Jesus tells us to do, we become like him. Servants don't become like masters. But friends become like each other. And that's the point that Jesus is making. You're my friends if you do what I command you. In other words, you produce fruit. In other words, you become like me. So what does Jesus command? Verse 12, this is my commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. <sighs> Love one another. I, I wasn't sure exactly how I was going to cope with this being our last Sunday here for a few weeks. I, as, as horrible and as 
dreadful as it's feeling now, I don't think I'll ever be able to leave Bethel permanently because I feel like my heart is here. And if I left, I'd be leaving behind my heart. In many respects, that's what's going on on Tuesday. We're flying out for 11 weeks, 10 weeks, whatever it is, and we're leaving our hearts behind. And it's because I love you. And I know that you love us. And that makes it very difficult. But it's also why we are going. Because we love you. And we want to keep being able to be part of you. And part of that requires us doing that. Jesus said, if you are my friends, you'll do what I say. And what I say is love one another. It's easy to love people that are just like us, have the same interests, support the same football team, sometimes the same age bracket, come from the same sort of background, look like us, sound like us. People that we have a physical connection to, it's easy to love them. But that's not necessarily the way the body of Christ works, is it? And we just look around this room and we see where it's different age groups and there's different backgrounds and there's different, some of you probably would like Southampton, anybody? No, okay, well, we wouldn't go that far then. Um, but there's, there, there's things that, that by nature should keep us apart. But we have something that brings us together that is deeper than all of that. And it's Jesus. Jesus says, love each other the way that I have loved you. Love is focusing on others. Love is focusing on what will help them to become more like Jesus or at least a better person. You're after what's best for them. That's why, kids, that's why your parents correct you. Because they love you and they want you to become a better person. They don't want you when you're my age, 50 some years old, every time you don't get a sweet, putting on your parts and laying on the floor and stamping your feet. They don't want you to keep doing that. So when you do that, you get in trouble for that. They're correcting your behavior. When we love each other, we should have each other's best interest at heart. So how do we love a brother or a sister in Christ? Pray for them. Help them. Comfort them. Support them. Love is not just an action though, is it? Because Jesus said, love each other the way that I have loved you. He loved fiercely. He loved violently and passionately. Jesus did. But he did it with the right attitude. Love is more than just an action. And it's more than just an attitude. It's no good to say, I love my wife and then I never do anything nice for her. I never do anything that encourages her or lifts her up or what's good for her. But I love her. And it's no good me doing those things if actually my motive is selfishness. I just want to do those nice things so that I get a nicer dinner. So, so love is more than an action and it's more than an attitude. It's the two together. And when you take one out, you no longer have love. Jesus says, love each other the way that I have loved you. Jesus' love was honest. Is there any doubt that Jesus loved Peter? And yet there was a time in Peter's life where Jesus literally actually called him the devil. I mean, talk about embarrassing in front of everybody. Especially after he thought he was doing something really good. He rebuked all of the disciples for forbidding the children to come to him, didn't he? You think that was embarrassing to the disciples? I mean, they're the, they're the inner circle. And all these people are around and surely everybody's paying attention to Jesus. But let's be honest, if you're one of the disciples, it's kind of cool too. And all of a sudden they get rebuked in front of the whole crowd. Why did Jesus do that? Because he loved them. Jesus says to his disciples at one point, Oh, you of little faith. Wow. That's the way Jesus loved. 
honestly. Honestly. Sometimes our love for other people requires that we be honest with them. I know I say often to people, be honest with me. And then as soon as they are, I regret having said that. Most Sundays, as we're going home, I will ask Tammy, how was the message? How did that go? <clears throat> good. <laughs> I know it wasn't good. <laughs> or she'll say, it was really great. I took some notes and here's what I learned. Then I know it was okay. <laughs> Sometimes our love for each other needs to be honest. Because it will help them to grow and it will help them to change. It will help make them better people. A lot of people don't like to receive this sort of love. But that doesn't mean it's not love. Jesus loved by being honest, but he also loved by being an example. He healed when people were ill. He fed when people were hungry. He protected when people were in danger. That's the way he showed love. Jesus says, you love each other the way that I have loved you. That's how we need to love each other. We need to be honest with each other. We need, to, we need to help when we can help. We need to feed when we can feed. And we need to protect when we can protect. Jesus loved by giving. And I would submit to you that love is always an act of giving. That's almost by definition what love is. He provided fish when he told the disciples to cast out their nets. He provided money to pay the taxes out of a fish's mouth. He provided himself. Verse 13 says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That's love. That's the ultimate love. And honestly, that's how we are to love each other. That's how Jesus started that whole little dialogue. You love each other the way that I have loved you. And that's how you will prove that you are my friends. So how do we know then that we are producing fruit? That's how we know if we are Jesus' friends. How do we know if we are producing fruit? Look at verse 18. Number one, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. That's how you will know if you are producing fruit. And producing fruit is becoming like Jesus. The world hated me, so if you're like me, it will also hate you. That's how you will know that you are producing fruit, that you are becoming Christ-like, because it will hate you as well. As well, The world persecuted, the world will persecute you like it persecuted Jesus. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. One of the examples of this is, is earlier in the book of John, chapter 9. Now, it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes. Do you remember that one? From That would have been about a year and a half ago. I think it was four chapters ago. <laughs> not really. So the Pharisees again asked him, how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So Jesus heals a blind man and the religious establishment come to him and say, that can't be from God because you did it in the wrong way. You did it on a, on a Sabbath. Not acceptable. Doesn't matter what you did. It was the way you did it. And that was just plain wrong. And I would submit to you that if, if we are being like Jesus, we will be persecuted like Jesus. So there are times when we will do things in God's name and for his glory. And the ones who should be supporting us will be the ones who are against us. Because that's what they did to Jesus. And Jesus says, if you are my friends, if you are my disciples, they will do the same thing to you. That's how you will know that you are producing fruit. Not that everybody will, will stand up and cheer. Yay, look at them. They're doing so great. I'm so happy to see them praying over their food now before they eat. 
It's so great that every time something good happens in their life that they give God the credit. I just love that about them now. No. People will persecute you for it. They'll call you names and they'll, they'll, they'll make fun of you. The more you act like Jesus, the more they will act like they acted towards Jesus, towards you. That's how you will know. John chapter 8. We won't go through the whole thing, but in verses 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. Does that sound familiar at all? And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus teaches them to follow him for true freedom. You would certainly think that a people who were living under the thumb of Rome, and under persecution and enslavement, would think, hey, this sounds great. This guy promises freedom. Let's go for it. But what did they say? They answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone whatever how is it that you say you will uh, become free they deny his power because they deny that they're even in slavery at all and then all the way down in verse 39 they answered him Abraham is our father Jesus said to them if you were Abraham's children you would be doing the works Abraham did but now you seek to kill me? A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. And of course he's implying that their father is the devil. Jesus gives proof that their ways are not leading them to God. Now let me, let me make the application into our present lives. We go about proclaiming the gospel, telling them they can find freedom from sin through Jesus Christ. That they can find a, a relationship to God through him. And people just, well, I'm Church of England. Well, well I've been, I was baptized when I was a baby. Well, I don't need religion. I'm a good person. I don't need whatever it is that you think you're promising me because I've got it sorted. And when he responds, and basically he's, he would say, and how's that going? That's basically what he's saying with this, with his response. And we could do the same thing. Well, how's that going? How is your, Christ, your, uh, your christening working out for you? Has it made you a better person? How's your life? And their response is, we were not born of sexual immorality like you. We have one father, even God. And my point is this, don't be surprised when people call you names for attempting to point out their wrong ways of thinking. And if you are producing fruit, you're thinking like Jesus and acting like Jesus. I promise you, when people see that fruit, they will call you names. They will. We're called bigots. We're called whatever, phobes. And it could be any number of things that you could put in there. And people say all sorts of things against us and call us all sorts of names. Because we act like Jesus. And don't be surprised. Jesus said that was going to happen. We're not greater than our master. And if we act like him, they will treat us the way they treated him. However, be careful that we make our motives the same as Jesus as well. It's sometimes easier to act like Jesus than to think like Jesus. I would say that it's easy to be contrary. It's hard to be loving. It's easy to say, I don't believe in this. I stand against that. But are we doing it because we love? Which is why Jesus did it. Make sure that our motivation is to bring glory to God. All these things they will do to you on account of my name. Because they do not know him who sent me but we do and we need to make sure that everything we do is for his glory not just what we do but why we do it 
All right. <clears throat> so how do we know we're producing fruit? The world will hate you like it hated Jesus. However, we will bear witness. That's how you know that you are producing fruit. You will, you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. The word witness, if you've known me for very long, if you've heard me preach very much, you'll know what that word witness is, right? Who knows the Greek word? Trevor, Matt, Tammy, martyr, martyr, that's right, martyreo. Were you looking it up? Oh, good for you. Martyreo, it's the word we get our English word martyr from. And it literally means somebody who gives evidence to the authenticity of something. So in a courtroom, when they would call in a witness, they were called martyrs. And they would say, tell us what you know about this situation. That's why the martyrs were called what they were. They were witnesses of Jesus. What do you know about this Jesus? I know he saved my life. I know he rubbed mud in my eyes and they wiped him away and I could see. That's all I can tell you. Well, deny that he is truly the son of God or else. And they wouldn't. Why? Because they couldn't change the facts. I can only tell you what I know. And what I know is that he changed my life. Your testimony, your life is a testimony to the fact that Jesus can set people free from their sin. So let me ask you, is that what your life screams out? Does it scream out to people when people look at your life? Jesus can set you free from sin. Jesus says, you will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. Because you've been with me, you are like me. So therefore now you are screaming out by your life what I look like, what I act like, who I am, and what I can do. But it's not just our life. It's our words. They should be testifying, not slandering the power of Jesus to save. And we do this because we've been with him. Not because I'm a better person. We don't say, you know what? You ought to come to church. It, it'll make you a better person. You should come to church because uh, we have great coffee. And you need to drink better coffee. You should come to our church because uh, we, have, we have some wonderful children. And you need to get around some good children. All of those things are side effects. And lots of other things are side effects. What our life should be screaming out is, I've been with Jesus and you need to be with him too. My life has been changed. My soul has been saved. My, I'm redeemed and I'm born again and I will never ever die. And I desperately want that for you as well. That's what our life should say and that's what our words should be saying. Because we've been with him. And we want others to be with him as well. So I have to ask the question. Are you producing fruit? Are you being like Jesus? Are you acting like him? If you are. Get ready to be pruned. If you're not. Get ready to be lifted up. So that's how you know. If you're a friend of Jesus. And how you know if you're producing fruit. And now the last one. How to know you are being pruned. Jesus said every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit he prunes. That it may bear more fruit. Now I'm actually going to go to two other passages. To close our study on John 15. To show you that what I've been trying to tell you over the last four weeks. Is not only contained in this passage. The first one is Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 4 of Hebrews 12 it says, In your struggle against sin, 
you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. In other words, as you, as a child of God, struggle, fight against sin, right? I would say that's producing fruit. You're on the road to becoming like Jesus and you're fighting against sin and you're, and you're knocking it out and you're getting rid of it, right? Look at verses 5 and 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation, the address that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastens every son he receives. In other words, the Lord will prune you because he loves you. He will discipline you because he loves you. As you fight against sin, God comes in and shows you more sin to fight against. As you start to conquer sin, God does not want you to become proud and boastful or sit at that level. He will now reveal something else in your life to fight against. He wants to show a little bit more of Christ now that you are showing a little bit. As you start to chip away at the selfishness and the, and the, the self-centeredness and the, the old man. And some of Christ starts to shine through. God doesn't want you to stop there. And so he prunes you. And he disciplines you. And as your children, parents, start to grow up. And as they start to become more mature. You don't want them to stay there. You want them to become more mature. So you keep correcting them. In fact, when they get the closest to being grown up as possible, they need the most correction as possible. Teenagers, right? They're nearly there. But we don't want them to stop there for heaven's sakes. A 50-year-old teenager, that is not what the world needs. And so we do even more correcting. That's exactly what Hebrews is telling us, which is exactly what Jesus was trying to get across to his disciples. Look at verses 7 and 8. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Does that language sound a little bit like, no longer do I call you servants, but now I call you friends? Why does God discipline us? Not because we are servants, but because we are sons and daughters, and he loves us desperately. There's a huge link between this Hebrews passage and John 15, explaining it all. God disciplines because the alternative, basically according to that passage, is that we would just run wild. Look at verse 10. For they disciplined us for a short, this is human fathers, they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them, but he, that's God, disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. That we may produce fruit. That we may become like him. That's why he disciplines us. That's why he prunes us. So that we can become like him. And verse 11. For the moment. All discipline seems painful. Yeah. You get pruned. It probably seems quite painful. To the branch. Rather than pleasant. But later, and here's why I really make this connection to John 15, but later it produces, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The author of Hebrews, which I think is Paul, makes a direct connection to John 15. The reason God disciplines us is so that we can yield peaceful fruit fruit of righteousness in other words become like Jesus how do you know you're being pruned because you're going to be disciplined 
Because God is going to come in and correct you. Because he's going to say, no, no, no. Don't do that. That's how you will know that you're producing fruit. Don't be discouraged when God does that. Be encouraged because he is showing his love to you. God will prune you. He will correct you as you grow. He will change your direction of growth. He doesn't want you all over the place. He wants you where he wants you because it will be a reflection of his glory as people look at his amazing garden. He will cut bits of you away because they aren't like Jesus. And he will teach you to rely on him. We're going to close by reading a passage and then I'm going to ask the team to come up as soon as I have finished reading to come up and lead us in some songs. Follow along as I read these words. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's double, he is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. And if that doesn't ring a bell, you haven't been listening. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So for goodness sakes, for goodness sake, let's bear fruit and get ready to bear more fruit. Amen.